As a math geek, I'm always fascinated by the mathematical relationships in music. And today, I really want to dig into a relatively recent discovery, Euclidean rhythms or patterns. These can be a really effective way to create and explore real rhythms from around the world. There are a number of modules that are dedicated to Euclidean rhythms, but it's also a common feature in more general modules like Pamela's new workout. But it's important to remember that you don't need a specialized module. If you have just a regular trigger sequencer, you can do everything I'm about to describe here. The historical details are covered well enough elsewhere, and I want to get to the good stuff fairly fast. So I'm just going to quickly give the historical context for this invention, discovery. It's hard to say which it is. And then I'm going to give a quick and painless overview of how prime numbers fit into things. Then I'll dig into how to manipulate the three main variables in a Euclidean rhythm and show some example uses for them. Then I'm going to make a quick digression into how they can enable odd time signatures. And then at the end, I have a bit of a catalog of sorts of different settings you can use and how they reflect music from around the world. If you want to refer back to these slides, they're going to be available for download at the link below or in the description. So let's start with Euclid. 2300 years ago, he developed a process or algorithm for finding the greatest common divisor of two numbers. How that algorithm works doesn't really matter for us, but we're going to talk about divisors a lot. Then there's Eric Borgland. He used that basic idea to manage the timing of events in a neutron accelerator. And then our man, Godfrey Toussaint, he identified that the same patterns that Borgland created appeared all over music. His paper is an interesting read, but I found that he left out some of the details that really bring it all home. So I'm going to restate a bunch of it here. This video is a lot to his work, and if you're curious, you should check it out. So I'm going to issue a math alert here. <laughs> it's not going to take long, and it's just grade school math. But if you've never really thought about prime numbers, this might be a bit confusing. Don't worry about it if you don't get it on first glance, but it'll help you understand what's happening later on. It's only a couple of minutes, so I hope you'll stick it out with me. So, divisors. If one whole number can divide into another and leave no remainder, then it is a divisor of that number. 4 divided by 2 equals 2, with nothing left over, so 2 is a divisor of 4. But if you divide 5 by 2, you get 2 and a half. That extra half means that 2 is not a divisor of 5. If a number divides another equally, it's a divisor. If it doesn't divide equally, it's not a divisor. Next, it might be obvious that 1 is always a divisor of every number. If you take 2 and divide it by 1, you get 2 with nothing left over. Divide 3 by 1 and you get 3, likewise no remainder. Even 0. 0 divided by 1 and you just get 0 with no remainder. 1 is a divisor of every whole number. And since it's universal, it often gets left out of the list of divisors that a number has. How about the number itself? 2 divided by 2 is 1. 13 divided by 13 is 1. 1 million and 3 divided by 1 million and 3 is 1. A number can always divide itself equally. And because of that, it's also left out of the list of divisors often. The time when those numbers are not left out is when those are the only divisors, one and the number itself. You may have heard that description. That's a prime number. Three only has divisors of one and three, so it's prime. Four can be divided by one, two, or four. And since it can be divided by two, it's not a prime number. So now we can talk about the common divisors that two numbers share. Let's say we've got the numbers 15 and 18. 15 is 1 times 3 times 5. 18 is 1 times 2 times 3 times 3. We don't usually count the 1 since it doesn't change anything, but it's going to come in handy in a minute. The largest and only divisor in common is 3. 2 doesn't divide into 15 equally, so we can't use it. 5 doesn't divide into 18 equally, so we can't use that. Only 3 works, and that's the greatest common divisor. An interesting case is when two numbers have no common divisors except 1. 10, for instance, is divisible by 2 and 5, and 21 is divisible by 3 and 7. But other than that, there's no overlap. The only number that divides them both, the greatest common divisor, is 1. We call that pair of numbers, 10 and 21, relatively prime, and we're going to come back to that soon. And that's the end of our emergency math alert. The only thing that you really have to take away from that is that sometimes numbers share divisors, like both 6 and 10 are divisible by 2, and sometimes there are no shared divisors, in which case we call them relatively prime. With that background in mind, let's look at Euclidean rhythms. The main question that they set out to answer is, how can you most evenly distribute events in a cycle? 
I tend to think of them as events. Toussaint calls them onsets in his paper. Once in a while, I'm just going to refer to a step as being on or off. So as you watch this, just remember that onset equals event equals on, and I just sort of go back and forth. So imagine we have a repeating cycle of eight steps and four events that we want to happen in those eight steps. Obviously, this currently is not the most evenly distributed possibility. It's still something you might want, but it's not what you turn to Euclidean rhythms for. Instead, we're going to want something like this. Now, it isn't super exciting. It's just four events distributed evenly around a cycle. That's because four, the number of events, is a divisor of eight, the number of steps. Four goes into eight evenly, so we get this pattern where there's an onset, then an empty step, then an onset, and an empty step, and so on. So I'm going to connect these onsets now, just to make things a little more clear. By convention, the top of the cycle is the first step, and for math and computer reasons, you may hear me call it step zero. Now notice that I can rotate this pattern. The relationship between the onsets stays the same, but now we start on a different point in the pattern. We're going to talk about that rotation more in a bit, but right now it's just important that you see that there are three main variables when we talk about Euclidean rhythms. The length of the pattern, the number of events or onsets in the pattern, and any rotation that might be applied to them. By the way, this sort of diagram is called a rhythm necklace in Toussaint's paper, which is pretty cool. It's nice because it's a pretty natural way to represent the cyclic nature of the rhythm. I'll use this format sometimes, but I'll also use a more linear style that behaves just like a drum machine that we're used to. Or sometimes I'll use both, just depending on what's most helpful. In Toussaint's paper, he used a little code of this format to describe a particular Euclidean rhythm. You might be worried that there's another math alert about to happen here, but really it's just shorthand for three events over eight steps. But that leaves something out. We just talked about rotation. So I'm going to take this one step further and write it like this. And we can interpret this as three events over eight steps and rotated by one. So let's look a bit at that E38 example. You may have noticed that three doesn't divide into eight. So what does that look like? Well, remember that the goal of Euclidean rhythm is to space out events as evenly as possible. And in this case, they can't be exactly even. There's three events and eight steps to spread them over. So the algorithm puts two steps between some events and one step between the others. Now, when we rotate it, all the events maintain the same relationship. We just change where we start the cycle. It might be a bit counterintuitive why I'm rotating counterclockwise. It's because we're starting the cycle one or more steps forward in the sequence. In this case, rotating by one means that what used to be step one is now step zero. And since we keep step zero at the top of the necklace, we have to rotate counterclockwise. So I'm going to get to some demos in just a moment, but continuing on with the idea of pairs of numbers that are relatively prime, why is that important? Why would it matter if they have a shared divisor? As an example, let's look at E48. 4 and 8 both share 4 as a divisor. So looking at 48, we see that it's just on off, on off, on off, on off. Now, if we divide both of those numbers by the shared divisor of 4, we get E12, which is pretty much the simplest of rhythms. It's two steps, one on, one off. But really, E48 is just repeating E12 four times. A shared divisor just indicates the repetition of a pattern. Let's look at another one. E46 has a shared divisor of 2. And if we divide both numbers by that shared divisor, we get E23. And all we end up doing is repeating that simpler version twice. And that's why we tend to deal with pairs of numbers with no shared divisors. All they really do is make things repeat, and we can do that other ways. All right, on to the demos. Let's give this a listen and explore it a bit. I'm going to use diagrams like this one with the necklace diagram showing the relationships between the notes staying the same as a rotation occurs. But I'm also going to use the drum machine style diagram. I'm using PAMS for the trigger and the 1010 music bitbox as my drums. To start, I just have it clapping at the start of every eight-step sequence, and then we can compare the results of the Euclidean rhythm as the offset changes. Watch those arrows. They indicate the start of the sequence, and you'll hear a hand clap when we get there. And then, pay attention to how the rhythm of the tom, being driven Euclideanistically, seems to change as we rotate. The drum strokes maintain the same relationship, but the effect can be quite different in relationship to the start of the sequence. So let's start the clapping and bring up the tom using E380. The 
You can definitely feel the difference between those long and short gaps between the toms. Now I'm going to change to E381, rotating by one step. And now the clap comes two steps later after the start. It's a pretty different effect. Now let's change it to E382. And again, the result is quite different. All that's really changed is the relationship between that hand clap at the start of every eight steps and the tom starting at a different point in the pattern, but it makes for a really different experience. I think that when people use Euclidean rhythms, they often forget about rotation. And when you start playing with them, make sure you dial through the options. You might find something cool. Now, of course, we can use two of them at the same time. Here's two different versions of E38, but with different rotations. One's playing the tom, the other's playing a wood block. but it can grow from there. Here are three different Euclidean rhythms alongside a regular even beat. Of course, I wasn't smart enough to write down the settings I was using. I think it was E381 for one of the toms, E716.0 running at double speed for the other, and then E1724 for the synth voice. And if there's one thing to notice about all those numbers, it's that each set is relatively prime. In these examples, everything fits pretty nicely into an even time signature. Everything breaks down into groups of eight steps, and they're easy to stack on top of each other. And even though they have a different number of events in their sequence, the sequence length is pretty standard. Now, I'm really not qualified to talk too much about music theory, but I think that something that gets lost in a lot of modular noodlings is a sense of time, in the time signature sense. It's easy enough just to get a clock signal going and let her rip, but that can end up feeling really unstructured. And there's a reason for that, we're not applying any structure. Or at least when we do, we just let a simple drum beat imply that structure for us rather than being explicit about it. In those cases, things like 2-4 time or 4-4 or 3-4 or 6-8, that top number is a multiple of 2 or 3, and the notes in those measures naturally fall into equal groupings of 2 or 3. 6-8 time, for instance, could be counted in groups of 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or in groups of 2. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. The important part is that they're all equal, and that means you can pretty much build up the groupings out of clock dividers and multipliers. But what about odd or irregular time signatures? Five, eight, or seven, eight, for instance. Cases where there are no equal grouping of notes. In those cases, things still get grouped into twos and threes, but each measure has some of each. Five, eight time, for instance, could be a group of two notes followed by a group of three or a group of three followed by a group of two in each measure. Often the first note will receive an accent, so in the first case the accent's going to fall on the first and third notes, and in the second case it'll fall on the first and fourth notes. But now we have a tool for breaking up events almost evenly. Let's think of the first case as the Euclidean rhythm E250. Since two doesn't divide equally into five, it has to split the cycle up into one set of two and one set of three, where the onset events indicate the start of each group. That makes it really easy to apply a little accent to the first note, and that adds a bit of structure. So let's give that a try. I have the depth for sequencer here, and it's just going to play a series of notes. And Pam's is configured as the clock, and it sends a reset every five steps to start the sequence over again. Pam's is also providing the uh, Euclidean rhythm, E25, and that's tweaking the filter cutoff. And we can do the same thing with 7-8 time. Here's a seven-step sequence running, and Pam's is outputting the Euclidean rhythm, E375, and you can hear the accents on the first, third, and fifth notes. Okay, that was just a quick digression that demonstrates that Euclidean rhythms can be used for different purposes. Anytime you can't use a regular clock divider because you need an unequal group of number of steps during a pattern, chances are there's a Euclidean rhythm waiting for you. So let's take a look at some.
Now in Toussaint's paper, he goes through and lists many different rhythms that appear in music from all over the world, from Dave Brubeck and Frank Zappa, to the samba and the tango, to clapping patterns that appear in the music of West Africa. I found the way that he organized them to be a bit awkward, and I think that grouping them by the length of pattern is more illustrative, so that's what I've done. I'm not going to dwell too long on these pages. Again, these slides are available at the link below or in the description if you want to come back and refer to them later. And now is a good time to reiterate that none of this requires a special module. I'm just going to show you a list of on and offs, and you can plug them into any old trigger sequencer you have. If you create something cool, drop a link in the comments. So let's explore this zoo. Starting with five step sequences, you might remember the first two as the two ways to create a 5-4 time signature. So it's no surprising to see Dave Brubeck's Take 5 in there. It's a common example given of music done in 5-4. How about six step patterns? Why are there so few? Well, remember the whole thing with common divisors, right? Six is one times two times three, and that means that if we tried to have two or three or four events in the pattern, we'd have a common divisor. Five is the only number smaller than six that's relatively prime to it. And there's even a few seven step patterns because seven is prime. So every number less than seven is relatively prime to it. Eight is a pretty common pattern length and any odd number is gonna be relatively prime. So it's no surprise to see three, five, and seven as the number of events spread out among those eight steps. Nine steps is a little weird, but if you look at that first example, an Alsac rhythm, the fact that Alsac is Bulgarian for limping or stumbling probably tells you how it's going to sound. And I honestly wasn't expecting to see 11 step patterns, but I suppose the fact that Frank Zappa is included here, I shouldn't be surprised. Now we're getting into the longer patterns. 12 step patterns appear in African music, it seems. And 16 step patterns are very common and include the bossa nova and the samba, as well as more music from Africa. And we wrap up with some 24 step patterns from Africa. Now, obviously these lists aren't comprehensive, but they're a good place to get started as you explore the power of Euclidean rhythms. So I guess that wraps up this video. I hope you found it interesting. And if you made it this far, maybe consider subscribing. It really helps the channel out. And it's great to know that people are making it all the way through. Thanks.